All right, so what are we preaching on this morning? The title of my sermon is called Regaining Our Momentum or Regaining, Regaining Your Momentum. Um, it's going to be applicable to us as a group as well as individually. And, um, you know, our church has been going through all kinds of different issues. And when I say our church, our church is a group of people. And the people within our church have been dealing with all kinds of things. I think this has been one of the roughest years uh, yet as far as people dealing with all kinds of various problems and issues and health problems and all kinds of things that are going on. Now, we know that, that really this shouldn't be a big surprise. You know, the Bible says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. There's many times where we suffer persecution, where people attack us, where family members or friends or other people, co-workers, you know, whoever it may be, may try to attack you, may, may actually wish ill upon you or cause you to get into trouble or, or bring bad, you know, whatever, problems your way because you believe the Bible, because of your stand. And this shouldn't surprise us. But, you know, also in the Christian life, things that maybe the world seems to get away with and, and the, the sins that they do and the things that, that, that they get into, they're not going to get the same type of punishment that a child of God would get because God, as a, as, as a loving father, when his children start to go astray, he's going to discipline them. The Bible says he scourges every son whom he receiveth. So, you know, regardless of the reason, and, and you know, every, anyone that's here today, you can make your own application. If you've been going through problems, is that a result of your own sin? Is it a result of, of other people coming, you know, whatever. It doesn't, that doesn't matter to me right now. What matters is, is being able to pick up and regain our momentum. Okay, so what, regardless of the situation, if you've had problems come your way this year, maybe it has nothing to do with sin. Maybe it has nothing to do with people persecuting you. I don't know. No matter what, though, if you find yourself in a position where you have had a lot of problems in your life, it's easy for you to be taken out of the Christian fight, to be taken out of doing the things that we're supposed to be doing. It's easier for you to get knocked out of church, to diminish your, your Bible reading and your prayer time and all the things that you're supposed to be doing. You know, when big events happen, tragic events happen, um, you know, anything that's, that's just adding a lot more stress, you know, wh whatever the case may be, these things are a lot more likely to get you to slow down in your efforts of serving the Lord and maybe even potentially knock you out altogether. So what do I mean by this? So an example of this is, you know, we've had a lot of people get very ill within our church and very sick and, and very seriously. You can look at the, the prayer lists and thank God it's about half of what it has been for most of the year. And those are good. There's a good reason why that's short. It's, it's not bad reasons, right? It's not uh, the, the people who've been taken off of that list so far. Praise God. They've been healed. They've, they've, they've you know, things are going better. So they're not, you know, we're not praying for them as much anymore. But what, what, um, what one of the concerns is when people get really sick, say they have an infection and they're hospitalized and, and they're out of their normal routine. Maybe normally they're coming to church regularly. They're reading the Bible. Everything's going good, going good, going good. They got their momentum going. And then, man, they're hit with some massive infection and they're hospitalized and they're out for a month and they're out for two months or whatever. And their normal routines and their normal patterns are broken. And the habits that you had formed, the good habits that you formed of making sure I'm reading my Bible, I'm praying, I'm soul winning, I'm coming to church, I'm doing all this stuff, that all gets broken because you have this, this major event that's happened in your life. And again, you know, doesn't have necessarily anything to do with sin. It's just something that happened. But we need to get back to regain our momentum, to get back in, in the swing of things. When, when that, you know, big tempest, that big storm is kind of passing, when, when these problems are starting to, to be dealt with and going away, we need to get, make sure we get back up in the saddle again. We get back and form, reform those, those good habits that we once had before and not allow ourselves to just be able to, to not do the things that you used to do anymore because you got so used to not doing them. Um, and that's just one example, you know, and I'm not picking on anyone in particular. The sermon isn't geared towards like one person like, oh man, yeah, this, I, he's talking about this person who is sick. You don't know. This is, this is uh, I want everyone to just take this internally for themselves 
And if things are going great, if you're if you riding high on momentum of, of doing uh, a lot of great work for the Lord and, and, you know, well, God bless you. Keep it up. But there's going to be things that are going to come along in your life that's going to try to bring you down. We all go. Have, we all have peaks and we have valleys in this life and, and varying degrees of, of how well we're serving God and, and how well things are just going in our life and various attacks that happen. And we need to be on guard, one, to make sure that, that we don't uh, completely just fall out of church or fall out of serving the Lord. But we can, we can get ourselves back into the swing of things. Now, we started off here in Jeremiah chapter 20. We see a little bit into the mind of Jeremiah at one point in his life. Jeremiah had a very difficult ministry and a very difficult job to do uh, as a preacher because he did not have a very good message. It was during a time when the children of Israel were about to be taken captive by the Babylonians and there was not many people preaching what Jeremiah was preaching, which is the truth, which is actually the word of God. There's a lot of false prophets out there trying to say, oh, no, God bless Israel. Everything's going to be good. We're all, you know, we're God's chosen people. He won't ever let anything bad happen to us. Everything's just fine. Oh, don't listen to Jeremiah. He's just, you know, trying to make, you know, he's working for the enemy and all this other nonsense. And he had everybody speaking bad against him when he was trying to give warning and tell them the truth and say, look, God's had it with you. God's had it with his people. You know, because of the sins of Manasseh, because of the sins of, of the people, God's judgment is coming. You know, we need, we need to just give up to the Babylonians and, and things will go well. God will spare you life. You know, this is what God wants you to do. He's trying to tell everyone that. And people weren't listening. Nobody was listening. So we get a little bit inside. And he had people coming after him. You know, Jeremiah was thrown into prison. He was thrown into a dungeon. He was given bread and he was just wallowing in a mire, literally. Like, it, it, he went through a lot. So it's understandable when we see some of the things that Jeremiah went through. And maybe some of you can relate to some of these things. I don't know, but we're going to look at this uh, to help us to, to understand you know, where people, where we can possibly get to and then we need, where we need to come back from. Look at verse number seven here in Jeremiah chapter 20. The Bible says, O Lord, thou hast deceived me and I was deceived. Thou art stronger than I and hast prevailed. I am in derision daily. Everyone mocketh me. So everyone was making fun of Jeremiah because of what he taught, what he believed. Because of the word of God, everyone was making fun of him. Verse number eight, for since I spake, I cried out. I cried violence and spoil. Now, why did he cry violence and spoil? Because he was warning the people. Because there was violence coming their way. There was spoil coming their way. They're going to be defeated by the Babylon. He's, he was preaching this. He's crying out. And like, hey, there's violence coming. There's spoil coming. What did they do? They mocked him. It says, because of the word of the Lord was made a reproach unto me and a derision daily. Verse number nine, then I said, I will not make mention of him. So he's fi he's, he finally got fed up and he says, fine, I just won't say anything at all then. If you guys are all just going to mock me and ridicule me, he says, I just won't speak. So he says, I will, I, will I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name. But his word was in mine heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones and I was weary with forbearing and I could not stay. So he had the burning inside of him. No you know, matter what, he didn't want to preach. He didn't want to tell people anymore because he was sick of the reaction. He was sick of their mocking. And he says, fine, I just won't say anything. But the word of the Lord was burning up inside of him until he couldn't, for, he says he couldn't forbear. He says, I couldn't take it anymore. I had to just speak because once you know the truth and once you have the word of God, you know, hopefully you ought to have the same type of burning and desire in your bosom if you have the truth, especially if you have the knowledge of the Savior, if you know that Jesus Christ saves souls from hell and you have that knowledge within you and there's people all around you that are dying and going to hell, I hope you have a burning in your bosom that tells you don't keep your mouth shut. Don't just stay silent. Don't just try to go along to get along and, and not offend anybody. No, you ought to have a burning inside of you like Jeremiah did to preach the truth, to just speak up and say, I can't withhold this because 
The Lord wants his word to be shed abroad. Look at verse number 10. For I heard the defaming of many, fear on every side. Report, say they, and we will report it. All my familiars watched for my halting, saying, Peradventure he will be enticed, and we shall prevail against him, and we shall take our revenge on him. There is people waiting for Jeremiah to fail. They were watching him. His enemies were, were, were just waiting at their opportunity. They're waiting for him to halt. They're waiting for him to stop. They're trying to get him to shut up. And see, this is the way that they would win is if Jeremiah would just shut up, if he would just stop preaching the word of the Lord. That's what the enemy wants. That's what Satan wants. That's what the enemy wants from you. He wants you to not, if you're, if you're a preacher of righteousness, if you go out and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, Satan doesn't want you to do that. So what's he going to do? He's going to do everything he can to try to get you to not do that anymore, to try to get you to halt. And he's going to be watching you. Look, that's not fun. It's not fun to have people mocking you all the time. It's not fun to have people ridiculing you. It's not, it's not fun. But you know what? It's what we're supposed to do. It's what God has told us to do. It's our job. Now, and the way that there's really ultimately no power, and we're going to see this in just a second, there's no real power that they had over Jeremiah to get him to stop. Because, why? Because God's not going to allow them to do that. If God had a job for Jeremiah to do, what they can do is try to get into his head. They can make things very difficult for him. They could cause him to fear and watch out for fear because people are going to try to make you afraid, especially when you make a stand for the Bible. We make a stand on God's word. Here, here's a perfect example of people who might try to make you afraid. It's the, the, the sodomite mafia that's out there, literally, that, that, that is going around and trying to destroy people's lives. You see it happen in the mainstream from time to time where you have a normal person. They don't even have to be saved or a Christian, just a normal person who thinks that, that homosexuality is disgusting and vile and wants to have nothing to do with it and think that that's, people are weird and screwed up that are into that. When anyone ever voices their opinion, what happens? The, the fear and the pressure comes down. Oh, you can't say that. No, we need to be taller. You need to love all these people. You, you need to accept this and is trying to cram it down your throat. And that's when the mocking and the ridiculing will come and the pressure and most of the time, these people have no back, not a strong enough backbone, at least. I want to say no backbone, no, not a strong enough back and bone to just say no, you know, this is, or, or not enough knowledge to just stand on the word of God and just say, no, you're wrong. This is what the Bible says. It's vile. It's wicked. The Bible says, even in the New Testament, that even as uh, God overthrew Sodom, he, he, he rained fire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah. And he, and he did that as an example to those who later, who afterwards should live ungodly. He gave that, that's an example for us today in the New Testament. That look, this is what God thinks about this. This is what God thinks about Sodomites. He burns down Sodom with fire and brimstone out of heaven. He sends in an angel not to save the people of Sodom, but to get Lot out of there because he's going to destroy the entire city because it's full of filth and wickedness and the people there are reprobate, rejected, and on their way to hell. But these are the types of things that we need to be aware of because the enemy is going to try to get you to fear. To have fear on every side. To watch for you to halt, to, to wait, and to try to jump at any opportunity he has to get you to just completely be out of the fight altogether. Verse number 11 here in Jeremiah 20, the Bible says, But the Lord is with me as a mighty, terrible one. Therefore, my persecutors shall stumble and they shall not prevail. They shall be greatly ashamed for they shall not prosper. Their everlasting confusion shall never be forgotten. And this is the hope that we have. It's just knowing that, hey, if you're, if you're preaching the Lord's word, if you're doing what's right, God's with you. There's no reason that God's going to forsake you when you're doing what's right. He knows that it's a difficult task. He knows that there's a lot of enemies. And we could know that those enemies can not prevail against you at all because God is with you. 
because you are preaching what's right. You are standing up for God, for his word. And look, I mean, these words, we didn't make these up, but we are supposed to preach them and defend them. This isn't, this is, I, didn't, I didn't write this book, but I believe every, every last line, every last word of this book, and I'll, I'll stand up and defend it, and I don't care whether it's popular or not. The Bible doesn't change. It doesn't change with the times. Right. Leviticus 20.13 doesn't change. It hasn't changed in thousands of years. If a man therefore lie with mankind, he's a liar with a woman. He shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon him. That, that verse hasn't changed. God's view of, of, of that hasn't changed. And you know what? My view isn't going to change on that unless I need to get even more right with the Bible. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 12, Jeremiah chapter 20, the Bible says, But O Lord of hosts that triest the righteous and seest the reins and the heart, let me see thy vengeance on them, for unto thee have I opened my cause. And see, people have a problem with this, but this is completely biblical of, of men of God wanting to see God's righteousness and God's judgment on wicked people that are trying to stop the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're trying to stop the good news. To see God's justice on them. Not taking matters in your own hands, of course not. We don't believe that at all. The Lord, the Lord is the one that's going to recompense. The Lord shall repay. We wait on God to right all the wrongs. But wanting to see God's vengeance, Jeremiah was righteously doing so. The Bible says that we're going to, you know, those that are, that are alive or they get martyred during the end times, they're going to be up in heaven going, how long, Lord, holy and true, does not avenge our blood upon the earth? When they're being killed and slaughtered by God-haters, by, by you know, people who have received the Antichrist as their Christ and uh, have gone through all this persecution, you know, they're, going to be, <clears throat> they're going to be entreating the Lord to revenge their blood. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 13. Sing unto the Lord. Praise ye the Lord, for he hath delivered the soul of the poor from the hand of evildoers. Cursed be the day wherein I was born. Look, this is, this is real interesting, this shift here. And again, we see a little bit into the mindset of, of Jeremiah, how he goes from saying, you know, we need to trust in God and he's the one who's going to revenge. You know, we sing praises unto the Lord, but then in the next verse, verse 14, he says, Cursed be the day wherein I was born. Let not the day wherein my mother bare me be blessed. Cursed be the man who brought tidings to my father, saying, A man-child is born unto thee, making him very glad. And let that man be as the cities which the Lord overthrew and repented not. And let him hear the cry in the morning and the shouting at noontime, because he slew me not from the womb, or that my mother might have been my grave and her womb to be always great with me. Wherefore came I forth out of the womb to see labor and sorrow that my days should be consumed with shame. So even having a knowledge that God is with us to protect us, it still doesn't mean we might not get depressed, that we might not get sad, we might not still start to see it, have like a woe is me type of an attitude here. And, you know, it's hard to... to to be real rough on Jeremiah seeing everything that he went through, right? It's, it's easy, it, it may be easy to do it, but I'd be careful with, with judging too, too harshly on, on Jeremiah here. Uh, he went through quite a bit of opposition. Uh, I'm sure it seemed like to Jeremiah that his ministry was failing because no one was listening to him. I mean, over and over and over again, you read the book and he's just warned. It's just like, Every single thing he's instructing the children of Israel to do, he's instructing the kings to do, he's instructing everyone to do, they do the exact opposite. They literally just do everything opposite to what Jeremiah was saying to do. Now, you could look at that and be like, wow, what a total failure, right? The world would look at that and see, oh, who's this guy? Oh, Jeremiah, he thinks he's a prophet. He thinks he's a man of God. No one's even listening to him. Well, what about Noah? Was Noah a man of God? 
No one seemed to be listening to him either when he was warning about the destruction of the flood that was going to come. You better believe these, these are great men of the Bible. So we can't get caught up sometimes in what the world might look at as success. We need to remember, turn if you would to Ezekiel chapter 2. Ezekiel chapter 2, just uh, <clears throat> a little bit forward. Jeremiah Lamentations, Ezekiel. You see, the job of the prophet is not to build a following. It's not to build the church. Actually, God is the one who promised to build the church. But the job of the prophet or the preacher, the, the man of God who's to go out and preach God's word, his job is literally to preach God's word. That's what he wants them to do. And, and whether or not the people listen, that's not his responsibility because you can't make people listen to you. But what you can do is do what God tells you to do, and that's preach his word. Ezekiel chapter 2, he explains this to Ezekiel, and it's a very similar instruction that he gave to Jeremiah as well. Verse number, <clears throat> verse number 3, the Bible says, And he said unto me, Son of man, I send thee to the children of Israel to a rebellious nation that hath rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me, even unto this very day. For they are impudent children and stiff-hearted. I do send thee unto them, and thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God. And that's what he says. Look, I'm going to send you to people, and you just need to say, Thus saith the Lord God. That's your job. Say, I have a message that you need to tell to these people. It's from God, and you just deliver that message. Verse number five. And they, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are a rebellious house, yet shall know that there hath been a prophet among them. And thou, son of man, be not afraid of them, neither be afraid of their words, though briars and thorns be with thee, and thou dost dwell among scorpions, be not afraid of their words, nor be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. The people that don't want to hear God's word, they're going to try to instill fear into the prophet. They're trying to do that to Jeremiah. They try to do that to Ezekiel. That's why God gave the warning and the message in advance, saying, hey, they're going to try to make you afraid. Don't be afraid of their faces. Don't worry when people give you dirty looks as you're preaching my word. Don't worry about any of that. He says, you just preach my word. He says, even though the rebellious house, verse number seven there says, and thou shalt speak my words unto them, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are most rebellious. So what's going to determine the success of that preacher is whether or not he preaches God's word. It's not whether they hear. You don't have to be the most persuasive person and get all these people to follow you. You just need to be able to preach God's word and every word of God. Not cherry pick, not change the message, not trim the message, not make it a little bit more palatable for people. No, that's not your job. He says, this is what I want you to say. Thus saith the Lord God. And you just deliver that message. You just stand up in front of people. You be willing to accept ridicule. Be really willing to accept mocking and, and persecution. But preach my words. That's a successful preacher. That's a successful prophet. Regardless of how many people follow that person. Regardless of, of how big of a group that, that they have to, to, to listen to them. The successful prophet is going to be the one that does what God says and warns other people and tells other people about what God says. Verse number eight there, he says, But thou, son of man, hear what I say unto thee. Be not thou rebellious like that rebellious house. Open thy mouth and eat that I give thee. He's saying, okay, they're rebellious. They don't like to listen. They don't want to hear anything. I've got a message for you. He's saying, but you better not be like them. You do what I'm telling you to do. You preach to them. You, he says, basically, you open up your mouth and eat what I give these. God's going to give them the message, and he's going to, 
to have to retransmit that same message unto everyone. Verse number nine, and when I looked, behold, and hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll of a book was therein, and he spread it before me, and it was written within and without, and there was written therein lamentations and mourning and woe. And again, I mentioned this earlier, that's not a popular message. See, people want to come to church and just hear how good you're doing. Get a good slap on the back, come in once a week, Hey, how's everything going? Oh, man, it's great. Yeah, God bless you. Everything's going great. Everything's wonderful. Everything's rainbows and sunshine. And keep doing what you're doing, and, and we'll see you again next week. People like to hear that. People like to hear that whether it's true or not. Now, look, I'm all for the positive message. I, I'll preach positive messages, and I'll preach it, though, when it's true when it's right, when it's appropriate, when there's a reason to think, hey, there's, there's goodness, there's blessing. There's a lot of blessings of God. God has a lot of long-suffering. God is very merciful. And, and, and the Bible says over and over again how merciful the Lord is, and praise God for that. And those are good messages, and we need to hear that. But I'll tell you what, that is not all that God is about. And, and more often than not, what we really need to be hearing about is more than just his mercy. We need to be hearing about getting right with God. We need to hear about his anger and his wrath and his chastening because we as children of God need to know that while our loving heavenly father is merciful, we can't just go and tempt God and just get off into all kinds of trouble and sin and expect nothing bad to happen. Just, oh yeah, He's just like this pushover God that is very merciful. Along oh, I'll just, I'll just shed a few tears and everything will be just fine. That's not the way God works. God's a loving father. And I'll tell you what, that's not the way it works with me and my children. And I try to, I try to be a father that would be pleasing in God's sight. Children, whether physically in this earth or spiritually in God's family, need to be disciplined, need to be corrected when, we get, when they start getting into uh, doing things that are wrong and being disobedient. And it's the same way with God. And we need to hear that type of preaching because God's given us instruction. He's told us what to do. He's told us what not to do. And we need to hear a lot of that to make sure that we are right with God. Turn, if you would, to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. I don't want to get too far off subject because... The subject this morning is about getting back into the swing of things. It's about getting back up in the saddle, getting, getting back up after either defeat or after a big fight, a battle, a spiritual battle. Things are going on. You've gone through this big storm. You've had this great tempest in your life. Let's get back into the swing of things. Let's get things back together. Let's get motivated. Philippians chapter number three. Now this is a very encouraging passage and this is great. And I thank God for the encouragement that we receive from his word and, and the ability to, to be able to move forward. We got to be careful not to get stuck into that mentality that Jeremiah had for that brief moment where he, uh, he didn't want to say anything. He wanted to hold his peace. He didn't want to preach God's word and where he was actually lamenting the day wherein he was born because of all the adversity and because of all the problems he did and because he felt like such a failure. We need to be careful not to get wrapped up in that. We can see how that can happen. But we need to be able to, to put all of that behind us and put the, the bad parts, the worst parts the, the things that have been happening to you maybe this year or recently, be able to put that behind you. And you don't necessarily forget about it altogether, but, but we need to be able to, to, to refocus and make sure that our focus is still moving forward. Look at verse number 13 of Philippians chapter 3. Philippians 3.13. The Bible says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. See, we can't dwell in the past. The things that are behind you, you can't change that. It's done. It's over. Whether, whether you screwed up, whether someone else screwed up, it doesn't matter. Whatever is behind you now, it's behind you. Let the past be, and let's keep moving forward. 
We can't change the things that have already happened. It's already done. And if, it's, and if you've screwed up, then you confess your sin to God, you forsake it, and you still focus on moving forward. Someone else has done you wrong. Hey, the past is the past. Put it behind you. Let's focus on moving forward. Let's keep going in the right direction. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. Verse 14, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us, therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. This is the type of mind that we have to have. Let's press towards that mark. There's a mark set for us as a prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus that we are looking to attain. Verse 16, nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. There, you know, our, um, our Christian life, we're striving to do, hopefully you're striving to go better and better and better, do more and more and more, serve God more with your life and get more and more sin. At, you know, just, just keep on this upward path of, of trying to do your best. And where to we have already attained, whatever level you've already got to, he says, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Let's be careful where we're at. We don't want to backslide and, and, and go back down the ladder. But whatever we've already attained to, let us walk by the same rule and let's keep our eyes focused on that mark. Look, none of us has arrived. And if you think you've arrived, then you've set the bar way, way too low than, than what God's bar is in your life for that, for that mark for the prize of the high calling. If you think you've already achieved that, then you need to read your Bible. Uh, I'm not even going to say again, you need to read your Bible because you probably haven't read it even cover to cover yet if you, th if you think that you've already arrived. But um, we, need, we need to keep moving forward. We need to keep the right focus. Verse number 17, Brethren, be followers together of me. And mark them which walk, so as you have us for an example. Having an example is important, and who we surround ourselves with is also important. And we need to be aware of the dangers of surrounding ourselves with people who are completely backsliding, because they will affect you as well. And I'm not saying... You necessarily, you know, just completely shun people, but you just, you have to keep it in mind what, um, and I'm not saying that, I'm not saying that just shun people uh, necessarily that are, that, are, that are backsliding if they're getting into certain sins. You know, obviously the Bible calls out in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 who we're not supposed to fellowship with anymore, and those are very serious sins, you know, fornicators, drunkards, things like that. Those people you don't eat with. But be careful how much time you're spending around people who are just completely going the wrong direction. Don't let them influence you. What, what, I, what I see happen all the time, just kind of as an outsider standpoint, just not even just as a pastor, but just being in churches, being around people for any length of time, you know, you see one person kind of getting into some, some sin in their life, which, look, we all have sin. But what happens then is that oftentimes then you see another person kind of doing the same thing and then you see a whole group of friends all going that same path and getting mixed up in the same type of sin. Why? Because they're, they're all friends with each other and they all rub off on each other. And we need to make sure that we are being an encouragement, um, one, to help people that, that might, we might see indications of them starting to get into certain sins, bring it up to them. Now, I know it's not, comfor you know it's not always the comfortable thing to do. But if you have the right spirit, if you're not being condescending, you can bring things up to people that you care about because they're your friends to try to help them. Sometimes it may need to be a little bit stern where people are wrong. And it, you know, oftentimes what people just need is for someone to tell them, hey, you're wrong. Because when people are silent about things, when you, know, when you have a good friend and you can see, oh man, they're getting into this sin or they're getting into that sin, 
and I can see this happening, but you don't say anything. And they know, and you both know, you're like, you, know, you know all the same information. They get emboldened when you don't say anything. Because they're starting to think that what they're doing is okay, even though they might know that it's not right. They could continue down that same path. And, you know, the Bible says that faithful are the wounds of a friend. You know, you might have to say things sometimes to people that, uh, that hurt temporarily. But ultimately, it's going to be, it is in their best interest. You know, a, a real easy analogy for this is telling people that are unsaved that if they don't get saved, they're going to go to hell. Right? That is totally true. It's the truth. People need to hear that because it may not be pleasant for someone to like, oh man, what are you judging me? You think I'm going to, you know, it's like, no, I'm trying to help you. Okay? God's the one who's going to judge you, but he's already written the judgment and, and the Bible says what it says. Okay? I can't change that. But what I can do is tell you about it. I can tell you that your soul's in trouble. I can tell you that, that the Bible says getting saved is really easy, that all you have to do is put your faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. That's what the Bible says. But you have to realize, you know, people have to realize that they're, they're sinners and that they deserve a punishment in hell. That's a fact. And without hearing that, oftentimes people will think, well, I'm a good person. I'm okay. I'm going to heaven. But if you're going to help that person to get saved, they need to realize you're actually not a good person in God's eyes because for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says that there is none good. No, not one. We all need a savior. We all need someone to save our soul. And that's, see, that's a, that's a way that you help people. And again, there's, there's a tact to how you approach someone. But I mean, if they're your friend, they're not just some stranger. They're somebody that you know. You ought to be able to, to bring up some things that are a little bit uncomfortable in you know, trying to help them to get back on the right path. Because that's... That's what we want. That's the, goal. That's the goal of my sermon this morning is to help us all to get back on track and to be able to put things behind us when, um, when, when we've done wrong or when bad things have happened and be able to focus on getting back right with God. So the Apostle Paul here is saying in verse 17, now we just read, brethren, be followers together of me. He's saying, look, I'm giving you a good example. Follow me. Follow this example. And mark them which walk. So you have us, for example, for many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. So look at these enemies of the cross of Christ. One of the, one of the attributes here says they mind earthly things. We need to be followers of that which is good, of these good examples. The Apostle Paul is a great example of someone that we can look to to emulate, someone that we can look to to, to let's say, let's pattern our life after someone like the Apostle Paul and not after these enemies of the cross of Christ. And what boggles my mind is when Christians today get so caught up in the things of this world, in the television programming, in the movie. Pro look, you, do you even realize when you go out and you pay that money at the box office, at the, the local movie theater, and you watch the movies produced by the wicked perverts in Hollywood, and you're giving your money to that, and you're allowing their influence now to come into your, your mind, you're supporting the enemies of the cross of Christ. So why do you mean they're enemies? Do you know how many sodomites there are that are acting out in these movies? They mind earthly things. Their conversation is on things of this earth. It's, there's wickedness. There's adultery. There's all kinds of filth that you choose to be your entertainment. And say, oh, I just want to have a little bit of fun, so I'm going to go watch a sodomite on the screen to give me some joy. You know, Lot pitched his tent toward Sodom before he actually ended up in the city. 
He liked looking at it from a distance. He was entertained looking at, oh, wow, look at that great city. Oh, look at what's going on over there. He was intrigued by it. And he set his tent toward Sodom. The next time you hear about, about Lot, he's in Sodom. And his, his righteous soul was vexed with the conversation of the wicked and all their wicked deeds and all their wicked acts that were going on in that city. We ought not to be looking to the heathen and to the wicked people of this world to provide us joy in this life or to provide us some type of entertainment. Why? Because they will influence you. There's an, if you don't believe there's an agenda, take a step back and look at the, I don't even want to call it quality of entertainment. Look at the content that has been pushed forward. And if you, and if you can do this with an honest heart, and just take a look back. Just look at movie titles and think about some of the themes and what's been promoted in these various movies throughout the ages. I mean, is it any surprise, and, and this, is a, this, this movie popped into my head, because I, I haven't watched Hollywood movies in, in I don't know how long, a really long time. But there's one that I watch, and, and it fits in because, what was it, um, Kevin Spacey just came out as some, as some homo predator, right? And is that some big surprise? Nope. Is it really some big surprise? I remember seeing a movie called American Beauty. It came out, I think it was in the 90s. The late 90s, uh, somewhere around that time, early 2000s, I don't remember exactly when it came out. I remember the first time I saw that movie, it made me sick to my stomach. I could not believe they even put that filth on the screen. And I, wa See, I don't even know if I was saved. I think I was saved at the time. I was saved at the time, but I was not going to church. I was not, you know, living the Christian life. But it's a story of, of a, of a middle-aged man who is a pedophile, who, who wants to have, who's dreaming about and lusting after some high school girl that's friends with his daughter. It's disgusting and it's perverted. And this is the type of film that, oh, it's such a great movie. Oh, it's filth and it's disgusting. And you know what? That was shocking for the time back then. What are they doing now? What images are they putting in front of your face now? And you know what they did with that? They tried to normalize that. It was shocking and disgusting, but what they try to do, it's just love, right? What do we have now? Hey, love is love. Hey, what, so what if a guy is 57 years old and a girl is 15 years old? Love is love, isn't it? Isn't that what, the, what Hollywood is trying to teach you? Love is love. Who cares if you have a 70-year-old man and a 6-year-old boy? They call it love. God calls it vile and beasts that are made to be taken and destroyed. So watch out for that filth. Be careful, because you know, this is going to drag you down. It is brainwashing. The, the goal is to get you to tolerate, and then not just tolerate, but accept, and then accept and promote. And it is aggressive agenda by people that hate God, that want to spew their filth, that are, that are proud and have no shame whatsoever, that are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Getting back right with God starts with your heart. If you're coming off of a big defeat or if you're coming off some other issues in your life, there is no magic formula to getting right with God other than just getting your heart right with God. Amen. If your tent is pitched towards Sodom, you're going to surround yourself with Sodomites and do nothing for God. You need to get your heart right with God to make a clean break. Once your heart's right, you need to put your backsliding to a stop. You need to put your foot down. You need to forget about all the reasons that may have allowed you to get to the point to where you were to begin with, with the backsliding. Because look, nobody, nobody backslides without having some justification in their head as to why what they're doing in that situation and in that instance is okay. And you need to be able to just, just put all that out because... All you're doing is deceiving yourself. 
You need to recognize where you're at and just say, this is where I'm at. This is wrong. I'm going to get my heart right with God. And any excuses that I've made before are literally just that. They're excuses. And I'm just going to confess and forsake my sin. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 32. I'm going to read for you from Proverbs 28, 13. The Bible says, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. So we're talking about forgetting those things which are behind and pushing forward into those which are ahead. We, we, don't, just, um, we don't try to just cover up our sins as if they didn't happen. We confess them and forsake them to God. And then we move forward. We have to deal with it. If, 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 if you're in a situation, you have a sin problem, you don't just, you, you know, you, you might want to just, okay, let's forget about that and move forward, but you got to deal with it. You got to deal with that sin problem. You need to be able to take it to God and say, God, admit, you know, I, I'm, I was wrong. I'm sorry, God, I was wrong. And I'm going to admit this. It was a sin. And I'm not going to do it again. I'm going to forsake it and then move forward. And that's, that's the right way. That's going to be the best way for you to, to be able to move forward and to get back into the swing of things. And God, will, God does have mercy. And that's why he says, uh, but whoso for, confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. God has mercy when you do that. And that is good news. But we need to humble ourselves, humble ourselves to be able to admit that you are wrong. To be able to admit that whatever it is that you're doing was wicked, is wrong, and, and we're going to confess that to God, we're going to forsake it. Uh, the Bible says, after that, happy is the man that feareth alway, but he that hardeneth his heart shall fall into mischief. I had you turn to Psalm 32. Psalm 32 is another great psalm regarding, you know, David. David was a, was a man of God. David was a man of God that had a lot of sin. David made a lot of mistakes in his life, but you know what? His life is, is a success. He, he's always viewed as a, a, a man of God, as, as a success. Why? Because he kept his integrity unto the end. He kept his faith unto the end. He, he, he made a lot of mistakes along the way, but he got right with God after making those mistakes. He didn't harden his heart. He didn't, he didn't stiffen his neck and say, no, I'm right, God, you're wrong, or everyone else is wrong, or whatever, and just hold on to some kind of pride. David, when he did wrong, would confess and forsake his sins, which is why he was a man after God's own heart, which is why he is continually referred to as being a great man. You read through the books of, of First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles, and he is always a standard of someone who did right in the eyes of the Lord even though he had major sin problems. Look at verse number one there, Psalm 32. The Bible says, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Which, by the way, Old Testament, during the, the, the Mosaic Law time period, salvation comes by grace through faith, Amen. whose sin is covered. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. Praise God for salvation by grace through faith in all time. Look at verse number three. When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. So this is talking about David, night and day, God's hand being heavy upon him about him receiving of God's punishment and enduring through that. Verse number five, here's what he did as a result of God's heavy hand upon him. I acknowledged my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. Selah. God's merciful. He says, I confessed them, I forsook them, I, I, you know, I, and you forgave me. And praise God. Verse number six. For this shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. 
Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come nigh unto him. Thou art my hiding place, and thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. Selah, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. Be ye not as the horse or as the mule, which have no understanding, whose mouth must be held in with bit and bridle as they come near unto thee. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he that trusteth in the Lord, mercy shall compass him about. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, ye righteous, and shout for joy, all ye that are upright in heart. And that's the goal. We want to get back to being upright in heart before the Lord. Last place I'll have you turn, turn you into 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. I had a lot more that I wanted to cover, but it's, it's fine. We'll skip over all that. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 is where I want to close this morning. We're going to read in 2 Corinthians 7 how we can help get our zeal back. And again, this has, this has a little bit more connotations have to do with, with when you're in sin, when you do things that are wrong. Uh, I know I, I brought up there's many reasons why you may have been kind of gotten out of the swing of things, gotten out of, of your service to the Lord. But... Um, this in particular is going to be dealing mostly with when you get into sin, when you have a problem, when you have something wrong. And that, that really needs, the fixing that you need with that has to come from your heart. Because if your heart's not right, you, you're not going to get right with God at all. Your heart needs to start the way. You have to get your heart softened up. Um, and otherwise, your pride's going to be in the way, especially if you think that... that I didn't do anything wrong. I'm just fine or whatever. Like, like Saul, King Saul had a, had a big problem with that where he was never willing to admit that he did anything wrong. He always wanted to justify his actions and he never ended up getting right with God. I mean, I'm not saying he wasn't saved. I'm just saying that he was, uh, he, he was experiencing strife and problems in his life for the whole rest of his life when he wasn't, wouldn't acknowledge his sin and just do that which was right. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 7 we see here that, of course, is the second letter of the Apostle Paul to the, to the church at Corinth, to the Corinthians. And in his first letter, he wrote them, and it was kind of scathing in many areas on problems that they had within the church. And he was really laying into them and, and letting them know, you know, hey, you've got this problem, you've got this problem. You need to get these things fixed. You've got someone in your church who says that, that he's committing sin that such is his, even is named among the Gentiles that a man should have his father's wife. And he's calling out all these different things within the church. And he's saying, you've got to fix these problems. And you know what happens when he writes a letter like that? The people were grieved. It's sad in their hearts. Well, yeah, what do you expect, right? I mean, if someone writes you a letter and they're telling you all these things that you're doing that's wrong and all these areas where you're failing, that doesn't just bring a smile to your face. Right? You're going to be upset about that. You'll be a little sad about that. But it's for a good purpose. And he explains all that here in 2 Corinthians 7. Look at verse number 8. He says, For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent. He's like, I'm not changing my mind, though I did repent. So after he sent them the letter, he's, he's thinking like, oh man, should I have sent that? Was I a little bit too harsh? Maybe I should have done something different. And he was kind of changing his mind on sending it to him. But he's saying, you know, basically, after he thought about it a little bit more, he said, no, I don't repent. For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent, though I did repent. For I perceive that the same epistle, that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. He says, yeah, it made you sorry, but it was just for a short period of time. It was just for a season. Now I rejoice, not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. So he's saying, now I'm happy. I'm not happy because I made you sorry. I didn't, I didn't want to make you feel grieved. But I am happy that that grief made you come to repentance to actually change your actions, to actually change your mind and to, and to do things different. I am glad that, that my letter caused that type of change. He says, but that you sorrowed to repentance, for you were made sorry after a godly manner, 
that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. For behold, this selfsame thing, that ye sorrowed after a godly sort. So he says, behold, this thing. When you sorrow after a godly sort, when, when, when you face your own sins and your own problems, and you are sorry about it, and you have a contrite heart, when, when you, you humble yourself, and you're willing to confess that sin to God, and you're willing to forsake that sin, in the process of doing that, having this godly sorrow that works repentance, he says, see what, what carefulness it wrought in you, yea, what clearing of yourselves, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge. In all things, you have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. He's saying, I told you, I, I wrote that letter, it made you sorry, it grieved your heart, but it grieved your heart in the right way because you got right with God, and now you've got the zeal, now you've cleared yourself, now you've got vehement desire, now you're ready to work for the Lord again. And this is what we need to be able to do, is to get our hearts right, to get back to serving the Lord. You know, whatever it is that's been keeping you out, maybe, maybe health reasons got you started out, of church and out of your Bible and out of other things. But you can't blame everything on that. Because we need to be diligent in doing the things that God has for us to do and, and maintaining as, as, as a priority in our life. And sometimes when our whole life gets shaken up, it could be difficult, but we need to be able to, to reset and, and get things back to, to what we consider to be normal, what God would have for us to be a normal life, a normal life consisting of, of prayer, reading, sowing, you know, all, all the stuff that God has instructed for us to do. That ought to be our normal. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for the clear instruction that you do give us in the Bible. God, I pray that you would please help us collectively as a church to just get back uh, on fire to serve you and kind of get our, our focus realigned and, and where, where you are at the center, dear Lord, and help us to, to do many mighty works for you, dear God. Help, help us to be able to identify um, just personally the sins that have been holding us back, dear Lord, and, and to have soft hearts to be able to recognize that, to be able to confess those sins to you, Lord, and to forsake those sins, and, and that you can just kind of renew in us a right spirit and help us to, to serve you with, with as much, if not more, fervor than we've had in the past. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.